Hi, I'm Laura Coltis, your host for RC Light. This week's guest is author Lisa Moore. She's the writer of several books, two of which have been nominated for a Giller Prize. The winner of the Commonwealth Writers Prize Best Book Award and won top honors in the Canada Reads competition. And recently her novel Cot was the basis for a five part miniseries on CBC. Why not stay, watch and listen to the person behind the name and we'll be right back. This show is brought to you by the Craft Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. Visit us in our new space at 275 Duckworth Street and discover what it means to be handcrafted. Welcome back to the show. We open up with Lisa talking about the great news she received about her novel, Cot, being converted to a television miniseries. The idea of actors moving around and talking, you know, saying anything remotely like the words I had written and just that embodiment of what had been like a completely imaginary world, just that there, those voices and whatever it was, people are in actual physical bodies was just a thrill. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know what you based caught on. I sort of relate to the drug bust that went down. But the thing is, too, that Newfoundland at that time was going through all kinds of changes, like in the arts thing, never mind the drug thing. It was, uh, well, I guess drugs were a part of that scene, I suppose. But uh, Newfoundland was exploding in terms of art. Yeah, well, you know, particularly with the Mummers and Codco and making, you know, really um, hilarious but also dark theater, like a whole new kind of opening a new vein of uh, expression and really capturing what was going on here. And it wasn't some kind of cliched um, view of, you know, poor, hard done by fishermen. It was really people who were, had a voice and, you know, were funny about, about the experience here. And I think full of pride too for the life here. So that was, yes, you're right. All of that was happening with um, in the 70s. It was just going wild. It was happening with visual art, it was happening with um, particularly theater, I think. No, theater was heavy duty, yeah. And, uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, I mean, a lot of times there's a reaction to Newfoundlanders being pigeonholed, and then the artists, who I always claim in any society, always seem to lead the way. They're always the canary in the coal mine. And uh, I can remember Donna Butt going across the country with Daddy Wants a Train, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, people out in Vancouver and Toronto, they like it. And then they realize, oh my God, these Newfoundlanders, they got, they got something on the ball, right? Yeah, and I think, I think that that, had to, that kind of a thing was going on all over the world, in fact, because we were used to getting our culture from Britain or getting it from New York or getting it from, you know, London and, and, or Paris or, you know, those, those sort of empires of uh, colonialism. And, um, and then suddenly, at that time, probably like in the 70s, there were all these works in translation coming from smaller places, coming from um, India, not, not that India is smaller, but, you know, like, uh, places where the work was often translated. Mm -hmm. Africa, India, um, the Caribbean, all, all these new, vo new to us voices that, um, that it wasn't just that the voices were new, it meant the stories were new. It, they were, it was a new way of looking at the world. It, it broke up old ideas of what a, what a novel could be or what a story could be. And I think that was going on here too. Um, just the idea that our stories matter, all stories matter, mm -hmm. and, and we should have access to all of them. Mm -hmm. But I think too, there's a certain degree of sophistication uh, about a writer from India, a writer from Newfoundland, and it could be read by someone in Cape Town, and they relate to it. And I think that there's, a, the writing is good, but obviously there's a sophistication there that makes that connection happen. Yes, I mean, it is true that the universal is in the particular. Mm -hmm. And if we map out, you know, our, our experience on some level, of course we can have 
magic realism or it could be set on Mars, but it is also impossible not to write our experience. If it's Mars, then we're writing about, you know, I don't know, the color red or something <laughs> that we do know. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's what, it's that particularity of what we know in a given place that I think makes the writing, what people recognize is that, it, that attachment to knowing the particulars. And of course I brought up, I mentioned filmmaking there. Uh, Cot's been turned into a five-part miniseries. Uh, I have a friend who was very successful at writing uh, several books, <clears throat> and then he got into this idea, I'm going to write a novel now that's, that's uh, it's going to tailor-made to be turned into a film. And at the end of the day, he did, and the whole thing fell flat on his face because he was like servant to a master, right? Mm -hmm. are, are you concerned about that now for your next novel? Do you, do you think about maybe this is going to be turned into a film? And, no. I mean, I did for a little while. I thought, oh, I, I want to see this happen again. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that um, novels have a tremendous amount of freedom. You're not at all stuck in, when you're making a film, you have to be in a, in a very physical, you know, the requirements are very demanding. Oh, yeah. You have to have the right lighting, you know, you have to catch it at a certain time of day, the, the weather has to be right, everything has to be right to fit the script. But when you're writing, it, it is complete freedom. You can go backwards and forwards in time, you can, you can have your character, you know, in England and then have them in uh, Antarctica and they can go in the space of a page. You turn a page and then they're in Antarctica. So there's this tremendous freedom and I, I do, I like the idea of writing for television, like I will probably do that just because constraint is great too, just like the sonnet, which is, you know, such a demanding po poetry form we have to count the syllables and get them right and the meter and everything else. But um, so that's fun to play with. But I don't think I would ever write a novel so that it could be turned into a film. The fact that Caught could be turned into a television series was a fluke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I'm just curious too. Uh, uh, there, there's my granddaughter was uh, showing me a thing uh, on the computer. Basically, a story would go to a certain point, and then there'd be five options. The, the, the protagonist can commit suicide, they can uh, do this, be nice, they can be aggressive, whatever. And uh, do you do that? Like when you get to a point, you say, well, I'm gonna have a little bit of fun now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this character a little bit further out in a land that I didn't plan originally. Do, do you do that? Or? Well, I always say to my students, I teach creative writing at Memorial, um, you have to put your character in as much peril as you can possibly put them in oh and have it be believable. Because the whole thing about a novel is it has to be drama and it has to be, um, it has to be uncomfortable. There has to be a crisis. Mm -hmm. So if, if your character is lifting a scalding cup of tea to their lips, and the worst thing that this character could possibly do, they're not an axe murderer, they're not even a, you know, a pot dealer, they're, the very worst thing they can do is spill that tea, then you need to give them a tremor. So they, you, know, you need to bring them as close to spilling the tea as you can, but keep it believable to, to who that character is. And at the same time, make the consequences uh, for whatever is gonna happen to them huge. And that, I think, creates um, tension in, in a novel. Having your work turned into a miniseries puts you in rare and special company. When we return, we'll have a chat with Lisa at the Center for Newfoundland Studies where she talks about how important research is to her work. This show is brought to you by the Craft Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. Visit us in our new space at 275 Duckworth Street and discover what it means to be handcrafted. Glad to see you're still with us. Research, like money, doesn't grow on trees. It has to be hunted for and dug out in order for your novel or short story to have that ring of truth and reality to it. Lisa has found that the Center for Newfoundland Studies is a treasure trove of information 
and she's found out that it's a lot more than a place for just collecting data. Well, research is, uh, you know, you start off thinking that it's not important, and certainly there are some kinds of stories where it isn't important, you know. If you're writing a story about what it feels like to be a 10-year-old girl who was in a, you know, lost her mom or something, and you've gone through that, well, then you're really writing from your own experience. But uh, when stories uh, get reach further than your experience, your immediate experience, an intimate experience, then you do kind of need to know what the truth is uh, about like um, medical issues, for example, about, you know, I, I once taught a class online where um, someone had written uh, someone with mental illness and there was a, a psychiatrist in the class. So we would all write the psychiatrist and say, what are the right kind of drugs for this particular kind of pr problem? And mm -hmm. um, so the Center for Newfoundland Studies was a, is a really important place for me because my stories are often based in Newfoundland and um, it's, it's just like a tre treasure trove of information and you get, you know, things like this that are uh, news clippings that, you know, from, from the time and this is, this is a photocopy but sometimes there's the actual news clipping and it's all yellowed and the date is there mm -hmm. and you feel in touch with the time so even even like how news was written in 1974 is at your fingertips um, how the story unfolded back then like day by day that's there um, and then particular like then there's other kinds so for instance when i was writing caught i needed to find out how to get through the panama canal and so I, you know, I asked everybody I knew, like, do you know a sailor? Do you know someone who's ever been through the Panama Canal? Do you know someone who would have the knowledge of how to bring, you know, 900 pounds of marijuana in a, in a <laughs> sailboat through the Panama Canal? And finally, someone hooked me up with someone who wrote me a long description mm -hmm. of how to get through the Panama Canal. And... Uh, with a lot of drugs on board. And at a certain point, um, you know, I realized I just, because of the way the, the currents were running, because of uh, when the hurricane season was, and because of the timeline that I had already written into the novel, I, I didn't know how to get my characters uh, back, mm -hmm. um, back from where they'd picked up the drugs. I didn't know how to get them back in, in time to fit the timeline that was already built into the novel. Oh, yeah. And I woke up in the middle of the night and because they, they had to get back up the Pacific coast. That's where they were going. Mm -hmm. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized, no, these guys are Newfoundlanders. They're in trouble. They're going to come home. And so I wrote the same guy and said, um, how do you get back? You know, once you go through the Panama, how do you how do you get from the the Pacific to the North Atlantic, and sure. how do you get up mm -hmm. up the back up to Newfoundland? And it was, uh, and I lived in terror that it was impossible geographically, you know, sure. in terms of weather and time and all that for my novel. And the guy wrote back, easy, and you got to watch these um, sand. Uh, bars in this, you know, next to this thing, and you've got to look out for this, and you've got to move really fast through here, and this is how many knots uh, you'll be traveling That's to get incredible. back, and mm -hmm. if you want to get back by this date, which was already, you know, ha they had to be back by a particular date, then you've got to, you've got to tear through at this many knots, and you'll get there at that time, mm -hmm. and this is, that's a different kind of um, yeah, research. it seems like research is not just uh, getting out newspaper clippings. It is talking to people and uh, and getting a feel for what happened at any given time, at any part of. Uh, well, you're talking about COP, but also about February, talking about uh, the oil rig, Ocean Ranger going down. That must have been uh, where you talked to people. That was really important. I, I would did think. talk to people, but um, I talked to people who had lost people. But most of my research. At that time, uh, when I was writing about the Ocean Ranger, you know, my, my father had died suddenly of natural causes, and I was really drawing on that sense of a sudden loss. Mm -hmm. um, I read newspaper articles, but I really, I think one of the most transformative pieces of 
uh, research that I did was here in the Center for Newfoundland Studies where I read the uh, Royal Commission on the Ocean Ranger disaster and I understood really, really deeply you know, how wrong it was that that had happened. Mm -hmm. And I, I was sitting here under this light and like reading these pages that very clinically and clearly, transparently described all of the mistakes that had been made by the oil company. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was a very powerful experience for me. Mm -hmm. And then um, after the book was published, people came to me sure. and told me, about all kinds of stories of loss, but also people who had lost people on the Ocean Ranger. Mm -hmm. And even though the book was written, that's also a kind of exploration of, like that's also a kind of research. What happens after the book comes out? Uh, you know, you got the book out there, people are coming to you afterwards and, my God, I wish I had talked to that person beforehand. I got to this stage, you know, would it, uh, what you say, is that a frustration? Well, you know, I know because I, I talked to I talked to Susan Dodd, who uh, lost her brother on the Ocean Ranger, and she is a she is a academic um, at King's College, and she writes about disasters and culpability of you know big companies, and um, I, I had her read the manuscript to check it. Uh, to make sure she was doing her own work on the Ocean Ranger. She fact-checked it for me, you know, she was, she was careful to tell me, uh, you know, get, she gave me some good advice. Um, but I really do see books, even after they're published, as living things. Mm -hmm. And all of the conversation, and that is like academic articles written, or newspaper articles, or even a conversation I have in the street, um, all of that is part of the book for me. Like mm -hmm. all of that readings that I do, which you know I often travel. Writers are going all over the place, reading from their books, talking to audiences about the stories. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I really do think a, a book is a vessel for the story, and that all that experience around it is part of the book too, in a in a peculiar way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a, a certain type of? Uh uh, research you go after. I mean, we talked about newspaper clippings, people. Um, does that develop? You say, well, I better put a lot of emphasis on speaking, speaking to people who are actually involved. Or do, do you focus in on that, or does that have its own little momentum? No, yeah, no, I try to, uh, I try to avoid people who are actually involved in stories that might have come out of true life experiences because I want to have the freedom to fictionalize. Uh -huh. And I think when you speak to people who are very, very close to the subject, you are influenced. But my novels are novels, they're, they're fiction. So they are, not, they are not the true story. Sure. And, I, and I want to stray, I want to have the freedom to stray from the, if, from the true story, or I would write nonfiction. The life of a book goes on, and so does ideas for future novels. When we return, we'll have a chat with Lisa as she talks about other art forms she's involved with. This show is brought to you by the Craft Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. Visit us in our new space at 275 Duckworth Street and discover what it means to be handcrafted. Welcome back to our final segment on author Lisa Moore. Lisa is a graduate of NASCAT in Halifax. It was there that she pursued her passion for the visual arts, and despite her success as an author, she still paints with as much fervor as she does her writing. While painting a portrait of volunteer model Abigail Chubbs, she explains how painting actually helps her with her writing. I really, I really like painting, and uh, I went to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and I just find that the kind of concentration that you bring to painting um, especially if you're painting, if you're trying to paint what you actually see. It, it really feeds my writing because, and lately I've been working on portraiture, trying to make portraits, and I, I sort of made this New Year's resolution that I would paint, uh, you know, 52 portraits in a year, and uh, with a different uh, model every time. And I want the, uh, I just, I'm thinking about the ways that models are like characters in novels. Like I'm trying to think of what do we learn about a person by looking at their face? What do we learn about who they are? And what's the difference between what we see and who is inside? 
and just also how that person changes when you are looking at them and trying to figure out what it is you see when you when you look at their face. It's a very intimate uh, experience painting somebody and you know they have to have lots of patience. They're this beautiful little girl and because um, it, it takes me about an hour to get a to get something that's even remotely like a likeness and sometimes I have to go back and work on it after the person is gone. Um, I just love the experience of really looking and and talking to the person and thinking about who they are and how that relates to writing. And the way I write, often I write about images because images carry a lot of metaphorical content. Um, I write about the way things look. And uh, so I think at that time I thought I would make more art than I ever ended up doing. But lately I've returned to painting because it is a contemplative form. You know, you really get lost in it. And, um, and I just, I just love really looking to try and see what it is that the world looks like. I was very lucky uh, when I was um, 17, I went to Stephenville. There was an art school out there in the uh, uh, college. And I, I got to work with um, visiting artists and I got to work with uh, Gerald Squires, such a great teacher. I got to work with Don Wright. And um, these people, um, Ray Mackey, Gwen Lawson, um, these people really, and of course, Mary Pratt is, I don't paint at all like Mary Pratt, but I'm very interested in the sensuality of her work. Um, and I, I would say, you know, even though her painting doesn't uh, doesn't look anything like mine, I would say that I am in, in, my writing is influenced by her painting, and I've written about her, and I think about her work. So those are some of the the visual artists. I mean, I would say all of them. Everybody working here influences anybody who's trying to to paint. Uh, but certainly uh, Mary Pratt's uh, painting, you know, she, she paints about, she paints images that are, um, sometimes they're covered, like she might paint a turkey that's covered in tin foil, and you know it's a turkey, but the light is reflected off that tin foil, or if it's saran wrap, or if it's a, that opaque Tupperware container, and you can't, you think you know what's under there, but but you don't really because the light is reflected off the surface. And I think that's an interesting metaphor for domestic life for women, for the interior interiority of characters that you see in literature. Um, I think about her work that way. I think about what you see because it's hyper realism, but when you really look at it, you realize you don't quite know what's there. And I think that is magic. Magic is always afoot when it comes to Lisa's approach to art. Hope you enjoyed the show. See you next week.